I saw East Africa and thought a few million years ago, we humans took our first steps there. Our brains grew and changed. The old parts began to be guided by the new parts. And this made us human with compassion and foresight and reason. But instead, we listened to that reptilian voice within us, counseling fear, territoriality, aggression. We accepted the products of science. We rejected its methods. Maybe the reptiles will evolve intelligence once more. Perhaps one day, there will be civilizations again on Earth. There will be life. There will be intelligence. But there will be no more humans. Not here, not on a billion worlds. Every thinking person fears nuclear war, and every technological nation plans for it. Everyone knows it's madness, and every country has an excuse. There's a dreary chain of causality. The Germans were working on the bomb at the beginning of World War II, so the Americans had to make one first. If the Americans had one, the Russians had to have one. And then the British, the French, the Chinese, the Indians, the Pakistanis, many nations now collect nuclear weapons. They're easy to make. You can steal fissionable material from nuclear reactors. Nuclear weapons have almost become a home handicraft industry. The conventional bombs of World War II were called blockbusters. Filled with 20 tons of TNT, they could destroy a city block. All the bombs dropped on all the cities of World War II amounted to some two million tons of TNT, two megatons. Coventry and Rotterdam, Dresden and Tokyo, all the death that rained from the skies between 1939 and 1945. A 100,000 blockbusters two megatons. Today, two megatons is the equivalent of a single thermonuclear bomb, one bomb with the destructive force of the Second World War. But there are tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. The missile and bomber forces of the Soviet Union and the United States have warheads aimed at over 15,000 designated targets. No place on the planet is safe. The energy contained in these weapons Genies of death, patiently awaiting the rubbing of the lamps, totals far more than 10,000 megatons, but with the destruction concentrated efficiently, not over six years, but over a few hours. A blockbuster for every family on the planet. A World War II every second for the length of a lazy afternoon. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima killed 70,000 people. In a full nuclear exchange, in the paroxysm of global death, the equivalent of a million Hiroshima bombs would be dropped all over the world. But in such an exchange, not everyone would be killed by the blast and the firestorm and the immediate radiation. There would be other agonies, the loss of loved ones, the legions of the burned and blinded and mutilated, the absence of medical care, disease, plague, long-lived radiation poisoning the soil and the water, the threat of tumors and stillbirths and malformed children, and the hopeless sense of a civilization destroyed for nothing, the knowledge that we could have prevented it and did not. The global balance of terror pioneered by the United States and the Soviet Union, holds hostage all the citizens of the Earth. Each side persistently probes the limits of the other's tolerance. 
like the Cuban Missile Crisis, the testing of anti-satellite weapons, the Vietnam and Afghanistan wars. The hostile military establishments are locked in some ghastly mutual embrace. Each needs the other. But the balance of terror is a delicate balance with very little margin for miscalculation. And the world impoverishes itself by spending a trillion dollars a year on preparations for war and by employing perhaps half the scientists and high technologists on the planet in military endeavors. How would we explain all this to a dispassionate extraterrestrial observer? What account would we give of our stewardship of the planet Earth? We have heard the rationales offered by the superpowers. We know who speaks for the nations, but who speaks for the human species? Who speaks for Earth? From an extraterrestrial perspective, our global civilization is clearly on the edge of failure in the most important task it faces, preserving the lives and well-being of its citizens and the future habitability of the planet. But if we're willing to live with the growing likelihood of nuclear war, shouldn't we also be willing to explore vigorously every possible means to prevent nuclear war? Shouldn't we consider in every nation major changes in the traditional ways of doing things, a fundamental restructuring of economic, political, social, and religious institutions. We've reached a point where there can be no more special interests or special cases. Nuclear arms threaten every person on the earth. Fundamental changes in society are sometimes labeled um, impractical or contrary to human nature as if nuclear war were practical, or as if there were only one human nature. But fundamental changes can clearly be made. We're surrounded by them. In the last two centuries, abject slavery, which was with us for thousands of years, has almost entirely been eliminated in a stirring worldwide revolution. Women, systematically mistreated for millennia, are gradually gaining the political and economic power traditionally denied to them. And some wars of aggression have recently been stopped or curtailed because of a revulsion felt by the people in the aggressor nations. The old appeals to racial, sexual, and religious chauvinism and to rabid nationalist fervor are beginning not to work. A new consciousness is developing which sees the earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. We are one planet. <laughs>